Welcome. These videos were recorded while I taught econometrics over Zoom, but they were edited so that the student faces, the questions, and my answers to those questions do not appear. That explains why you may notice some unnatural transitions and why the videos are shorter than a normal lecture. But hopefully you enjoy them anyway. Bye now. I think we're ready to get started, okay? So today we have our lecture number eight, and it's gonna be about difference in differences. Um, and um, we're gonna go as follows. Um, you know, last class we were talking about panel data. We talk about the intuition behind panels, and then we also discuss the so-called first difference approach to estimate parameters in panel data, the demeaning technique, uh, both um, fitting into the family of fixed effects estimators, and then we also talk about random effects. Today is going to be related because diff and diff is sort of like um, another model that exploits two dimensions. And I'm going to start describing intuitively what diff and diff is about using what I call a two by two model, which is going to be two groups, two time periods. Okay. And then uh, once we understand the intuition there, we're going to move to the general case, um, which uh, mostly adds notation, but not um, anything that is really conceptual. And then after that, we're going to um, discuss synthetic controls. And then we're going to have some discussion. But uh, importantly, today, I'm not going to, this is not a lecture, and it, it's going to happen with a lot of the topics that I'm going to cover from now on. It's not a lecture that it is intended as, as a comprehensive, um, you know, um, description of a given tool, uh, in this case, different different synthetic controls. It's not that you just come to this lecture and then you go and now you know how to do everything about different diff and synthetic controls. These are more intended as an initial exposure to this topic so that you understand the main conceptual elements and what's really behind uh, the idea of these methods. And if tomorrow you're doing research and you want to use synthetic controls, you will have to go and read some of the references that I gave that are in the lecture notes and, you know, get uh, more into the details or perhaps taking some other class that goes in detail over these tools. Okay. But ideally what I intend here is that, you know, the main key elements. Okay. So that, you know, what these topics are about. All right. Setup. So today we'll focus again on the problems evaluating the impact of a program or treatment on a population outcome Y. So I'm going to be using potential outcomes again. Remember Y zero is, um, the potential outcome in the absence of a treatment and why one is a potential outcome in the presence of the treatment. Ideally, we would like to observe this Y one and Y zero for every unit that doesn't happen. So the entire approach of all these methods is to try to find ways to get around that problem. The treatment effect is the difference between Y one and Y zero. We said that multiple times, this is a random variable. So it means that the effects of the treatment on different units is heterogeneous. People may react differently. And a popular quantity of interest is the average treatment effect. Certainly not the only one. Uh, in many settings, it may not be even an interesting uh, parameter, but you know, it's definitely a popular one and the one that typically is used for like teaching purposes to understand how the mechanics work. So this expected value of y1 minus y0 is typically referred to the average stream as the average stream effect. And we're going to talk about it today. So I wrote here, a large fraction of the work in econometric theory precisely deals with deriving methods that may recover the average stream effect or similar quantities from observing y1 for individuals receiving treatment and y0 for individuals without the treatment. Okay. But never both. And the difference in differences, which is called sometimes abbreviated DD or DID approach is a popular method in this class, okay, that exploits group level treatment assignments that vary over time. So the idea is that we're going to use this idea that we have different groups, you know, typically it could be cities, counties, states, or um, something like that, that are going to be affected or subject to a treatment. Some of them will be subject to a treatment, some will not. 
And the important thing here is that this is not an experiment where we decide when to assign treatment. It's just something that happens in some environment. But we're going to exploit the fact that some groups are going to be subject to a treatment in some period of time and some groups are not going to be subject to that. And, and you know, that's going to be the game. In order to understand basically how these ideas work, I think the simplest case is uh, what I call a two by two case, okay, where you have two groups um, over two time periods. So group one is going to be the treated group, okay? And I work here, group one is exposed to a treatment in the second period, but not in the first period. So there are two periods and two groups. In the first period, okay, group one is not treated. In the second period, there was, say, a policy change. Something changed from period one to period two, and now group one is subject to a treatment. Whereas group two is what we call the untreated group and is not exposed to the treatment ever in the first period or in the second period. And so, you know, without adding complexity to the model, which we're not going to do for now, um, meaning covariates and other things, we're just going to have a sample here or forget about the sample. We're just going to have four random variables, which are going to be the outcomes of group J and period T. So we have two groups, two periods and the treatment assignment of group J in period T. And then, you know, um, essentially Y could be any type of outcome we care about. And this is going to be binary. In particular, D takes this particular form. It's just one for group one in period two and zero otherwise. Because the only group that is treated is group one in period two. Group one in period one, not treated. Group two, um, never treated. Okay, so notice how this uh, treatment, you know, takes this very simple um, indicator. And the parameter we will identify in this notation is this one, which I'm going to call theta, is the expected value of group one in period two, y1. Okay, so y1, two, one. So notation is kind of annoying, but, um, and the uh, kind of factual um, outcome of group one in period two without the treatment, okay? And if you look at this, this is about group one in period two. So this is an average treatment effect on the treated. So the parameter you get, you get here in general is an ATE on the treated, okay? Where like in other notation that we used before in the class, we wrote as expected value of y1 minus y0 conditional on d being equal to one, which is essentially another way of writing this. The notation here deviates a little bit from that, given that this notation is convenient for the derivations that we want to do today. Cool. So, um, you know, example, like if you grab any book or treatment on this topic, you know, probably one of the papers that they're gonna mention is this uh, popular paper by Karen Kruger, okay? So, which is, um, illustrates this idea quite well. So here on April 1st, 1992, New Jersey raised the state minimum wage from 425 to 505. And Karen Kruger collected data on employment at fast food restaurants in New Jersey in February. That would be T1. And again, in November, okay, that is T2. And in the middle, you have April. So that's where the treatment happened. And so this clearly is before the change. This is after the change. Um, and the goal is to study the effect of increasing the minimum wage on employment. So they also collected data from the same type of restaurants in Eastern Pennsylvania, which is essentially just across the river from New Jersey. The minimum wage in Pennsylvania stayed at 425 through this period, okay? So now if you understand and put this in our notation, New Jersey would be the first group, okay? And this Y would be employment at New Jersey before and after, okay? And then DT would denote the increase in the minimum wage, which only happens for New Jersey in period two, okay? So you see that it is exactly the setting that I described before, okay? And it's exactly this paper two by two case. So what's the identification um, uh, 
the the assumption that is driving identification in this model well this trick that we're going to show today is going to rely on something known as common trends okay the assumption that will be important for this approach is that when you compare take group two notice here i put it in orange group two and then you compare the before sorry af before and after uh for group two and the before and after for group one in expectations you're assuming those two things are the same and so what that means is that these two outcomes were um say growing or trending at the same rate in the absence of a treatment because you see here that we have zero 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 so they're saying without any treatment these two outcomes and again think about unemployment rate in new jersey and pennsylvania well those were like trending at the same rate and that is known as a common trends assumption um and so one convenient way of parameterizing that is this uh model over here which i'm going to use today which is just saying you know the outcome in the absence of the treatment potential outcomes y0 for group j in time t has um a group effect that we're going to call a to j a time effect that we're going to call um gamma t and some you know shock let's call it ujt where we're going to assume that ujt is mean zero and we're going to treat for simplicity this eta and gamma here as non-random like you know parameters nothing that we're going to um conclude today will depend on the simplifying assumptions that we're going to make through the day but the simplifying assumptions are going to really simplify the manipulations that we do and at the end of the day they're going to illustrate the main driving forces um equally well so note then that when you compute the expected value of j in period two with the expected value of j in period one this gives you um gamma two minus gamma one which we're going to call gamma i'm going to be using this notation as as i move forward and we're saying gamma is constants constant across groups gamma is gamma is not indexed by j when i just compare you know the growth rate of every j you get gamma okay and then it's essentially saying that is this assumption over here which is saying that both are just gamma that's what we're doing and then when you look at the treated potential outcome well it's the same this expected value but it has a theta here which is the difference between um the y1 and the y0 as we defined it in the previous slide here right so you add and subtract and so you see then that you can write this y2 y12 sorry as this okay so i wrote here in the example that i said before in the absence of a minimum wage change employment is determined by the sum of a time invariant state effect a year effect that is common across states and a zero mean shock which is the u all right so setup is simple let's see what we can get out of this so the first thing that you could imagine is that you could uh say all right let's do you know we have time periods here we could do like a uh, pre and post comparison or you can call it a time series analysis there's time going on uh i can just compare things before and after so this would be well let's take the treated um uh, group which is the second one and let's compare y22 with y21 so that is we can compute the expected value of y22 minus y21 so i just take the treated group over time and i compare before and after and so well in the second period y22 is treated so this is the potential outcome one whereas in the first period is not treated so this is zero and now we can use the expressions that we derived before this would be theta plus eta 2 plus gamma 2 minus this would be a to 2 plus gamma 1 and so this is going to be theta plus gamma 2 plus gamma 1 
and this is theta plus what I call gamma. Where here, this guy and this guy cancel out, of course. So I'm going to write here this comparison. Confounds trends with treatment effects. So you do this comparison, and then, yes, of course, you capture the effect theta that you're trying to identify, but that gets confounded also with, you know, the trends that are taking place even without treatment, okay? Meaning these groups are evolving over time. So even in the absence of the treatment, you will have this um, thing over here. So a pre-post comparison does not identify theta, it just gives you something that confounds theta with the trends, gammas. Okay. So that's that. And so then um, we have say, okay, we're not going to compare before and after, but we have different groups. So what if we compare just the treated group with the control group, uh, which just focus on the time period where things happen. So that would be comparing the second group in the second time period um, with, uh, whoopsie, with um, the first group in the second time period. So then you go, okay, expected value of y22 minus y12. And this gives us uh, expected value of y221 minus y120. And then again, there's just gonna be theta plus eta2 plus gamma2 minus this is the first group, eta1 plus gamma2. And this is going to be theta minus eta2 uh, what did I do? No. This is like eta2 minus eta1. And then we see that um, this and this cancel out. And so we can call, oh, I, I'm i making a mess here. Uh, okay, so you guys should pay more attention. The group that is treated is group one. And I'm writing everything here as if it was group two. So everything here should be one, two, one, 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 two, one, one. And so this would be Eta one plus gamma two plus minus eta one plus gamma one, and then these two cancel out. So this slide doesn't change much after you account for that. So let's just correct this. It's one two one one. Okay, and then. In the next slide, we should do the same. Group treated is one in period two, and then we're going to compare it with two in period two. So all this flip. One in two, two in two, one in two, two in two. And so it's eta one plus gamma two minus eta two plus gamma two. See, I remember that there was a minus here. That was my recollection.
And so I'm going to call this theta minus eta. And so now what we have here is the eta captures persistent heterogeneity or group heterogeneity. So then by making a treatment and control comparison, we also obtain theta here, but um, it's confounded now with the difference in the eta. There's something intrinsically different between in the example, New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And unless we assume that they're both the same, that there's nothing different between them, uh, you know, we're gonna be capturing both uh, the fact of the treatment and the effect of the differences between these two units. This is the usual thing that happens in a treatment control comparison when you don't have random assignment. Under random assignment, you take averages, and since the treatment assignment is random, then you um, can argue that these differences wash out in a way. But in this case, where we have that, you know, New Jersey decided to do something um, and Pennsylvania didn't, uh, there may be differences why one decided to do one thing and the other one didn't and so on and these are going to be essentially capture in in this ADA over here and so we do pre-post comparisons we have the problems of the trends we do treatment control comparisons we have the problems of the unobserved of heterogeneity all right so the idea is what if we do both what if we just take uh differences uh pre before and after and then uh, we compare treatment and control. So let's do that. So let, I'm gonna say, let's get this right, okay? The treated is the first one. Delta one, two is y one, two minus y one, one. Difference in outcome of the first group. Second period minus first period. Let's do the same for the second group. Again, before and after. And so now what we do is the expected value of the difference of these differences. And now we start getting a clue of about why it's called diff and diff. So this just gives us y12 minus y11 minus y22 minus y21. This replace with potential outcomes. And it's going to be y121. I'm gonna group things here, I'm just grouping things, nothing, not changing anything differently. Let me just do Y110 plus Y220 plus one two one zero. The only thing that I did was just to put a minus here and group everything. The reason I'm doing this is for you to notice that another way of interpreting what we're doing is that we are constructing this counterfactual potential outcome, which you may call y tilde one, two, zero. That's what we want. We want y one, two, zero the potential outcome of the first group in the second period without the treatment. We don't observe that. And so in practice, what we're doing here is taking these linear combinations of potential outcomes that are untreated, this particular one, and essentially we're calling that our counterfactual. Okay, so then what is this? Just do it. This is gonna be theta plus eta one plus gamma two minus and it's going to be eta one plus gamma one plus eta two plus 
gamma 2 minus eta 2 minus gamma 1. And so notice then here that here we have um, eta 2 and eta 2 cancel. And then we have gamma 1 and gamma 1 cancel. And so we have, actually, I don't want to cancel that like that. Let me just do it differently so that we can have a nicer interpretation. Let me cancel the eta's here that I want. And let me cancel this eta 1 with this eta 1. And so now this is theta plus gamma 2 minus gamma 1, which is gamma minus gamma 2 minus 1 of gamma 1, which is, again, gamma, which is theta. And here in this step, where we have gamma minus gamma, here's where the common trends kick in. Because essentially, we're removing the trend from the first group minus the trend from the second group. And we're saying that those are the same. And under this assumption, again, which is given by the structure that we're using, by computing the difference of the difference, okay, so here, you can say this is the difference of the difference. We can identify theta as long as we're willing to assume the common trans assumption. Okay, so graphically, things look like this. You can see this um, in one of the books that we have in the syllabus. And so notice here you have two trends. You have the employment trend in the control unit or group, okay? The employment trend in the treated one, okay? So you can see that, you know, they go, um, one is treated, the other one is control. When you just look at the control and then you compute the difference, what you have is the trend. Okay, when you just take the two states and then you compare the difference, what you have is the, the ADAS, which is the difference in the ionosphere heterogeneity, heterogeneity. And so what, uh, what different diff does is that it just looks at the trends that you have for the control group. And since you assume that, you know, those are um, without, in the absence of the treatment, these two groups would trend exactly the same. Well, you can say, what would be the counterfactual trend for the treated one, which would be this. It's just taking the parallel, this over here, right? They're parallel. And now, then you go and compare this point, which is the counterfactual point, with the one that actually happened, and that difference is theta. So what is this point? Well, this point is exactly that counterfactual that I wrote in our difference, if you look at it. And that is what different diff is doing. Questions? All right, so let's keep moving. Um, um, now, for the next few slides, I'm going to just show you how these things typically are estimated and how the mechanics work in general uh, without adding anything that is conceptually different to what we did. So suppose that we observe um, individual data. So we're still restricted to the case where we have outcomes and a treatment. There are no covariates or anything. But notice that I'm indexing things by I, J, and T. Okay? And so now... If you think about states and whatever, it's like imagine you have individual data on certain outcomes. So uh, what's going on right now is that the variables that you're going to observe are going to have units uh, within a group in a given time. And so it's still like a two by two case, but with individual data. And notice that in this type of models, the treatment doesn't happen at the individual level. It happens at the group level. Okay, so that's why D is not indexed by J. And so, all right, you just do the usual algebra, okay? 
uh, you know, yt is y1 times z, 1 minus z times y0, and you just worked it out. And then you have that you can write um, essentially the outcome as a function theta times d plus eta plus gamma plus u. So, and now what we have is that we can estimate theta by random regression of y i j t on d j t that includes units and time fixed effects. These are the units, these are the time fixed effects. Um, and that's how the regression sort of will work. That regression will recover theta. Okay. So I wrote here the regression formulation of diff and diff offers a convenient way to construct diff and diff estimates and standard errors. It also makes it easy to add additional groups and time periods. You know, once you have this type of formulation over here, you know, things are indexed by J, T, and I, and then now you, you're not restricted. You just do J2, T2, and so on. Or just um, work it out. So more generally, okay, you could imagine the following. Let's remove the individual data for now because I want to discuss another aspect. But suppose you have now many groups, many time periods, okay? And so now you consider this regression over here, which is the same one that we had in the previous slide, except that we don't have individual data. The observed data is the outcomes and the treatment for groups that now are gonna be partitioned in two. J is gonna be partitioned into the groups that are untreated and the groups that are treated not necessarily one and one as we were doing before. And then the time periods are gonna be the before and the after time periods, okay? For simplicity, we're gonna assume that, you know, again, when there's a policy change, the policy change happens at the same time for everybody. Of course, that doesn't have to be in general, but for exposition here, we're gonna do that. So here, T0 is a set of pre-treatment time periods. T1 is a set of post-treatment time periods. So suppose that there's a policy, policy change that happened in 2015, and you have, say, annual data, and you have from 2010 to 2020, well, then T0 is going to be 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14. And then T1 is just going to be 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay? Before and after. Then J0 is going to be the set of controlled units. All the units, you know, could be states, cities, or whatever grouping you have, that are not treated, that are never treated, not before, not after. And J1 is the set of treated units, which are the units that are gonna be untreated, okay, before, but are gonna be treated after. And so that's sort of like the partition that you do. So now we are interested in this parameter theta over here in this model, which gives us, again, the average treatment effect on the treated. And then you can do um, diff and diff, all right? And now you can do diff and diff, by the following way, you take the, you define this lambda and j, which is indexed by a group j, and then you compute the average of before and after. Okay, you average the outcome of this unit of all the time periods before the policy change, all the time periods after the following uh, policy change, and then you can show that theta hat n is just the difference of the difference. Now you take an average of all the units that are never treated, the ones that belong to J0, and all the units that are treated, okay, which are the ones that belong to J1. And then you can show that this theta hat here, which you can see how it has this functional form of a difference in difference, is the one that you will obtain by just running a regression. So these squares, it is easy to show that theta hat n is the least coarse estimator for regression of y on d with group fixed effects, the eta j's, and time fixed effects, the gamma j's. And, you know, simple algebra shows that theta hat minus theta essentially takes this form over here where, you know, you have the u's as opposed to the y's. And then you can see this is a difference in differences, okay? Inside, we have the difference between before and after, and outside, we have the difference of uh, treated and controlled units, okay? And again, you know, in this case, since I'm doing simple manipulations, we assume the expected value of this use is zero, then the expected value of theta hat is just theta. 
The estimator is also consistent and asymptotically normal in an asymptotic framework with a large number of treated and untreated groups. And this is key. So when you have a large number of treated and untreated groups, then you can invoke standard asymptotics, okay? And then you will have that the estimator is just gonna be consistent and asymptotically normal. The parameter theta, as I wrote, as I said earlier, could be interpreted as an ATT, okay? An average treatment effect on the treated under the assumption that, you know, this object is constant for all J and T, okay? We have that multiple groups that are being subject to the treatment, okay? And so, um, in order to interpret our theta as an average treatment on the treated, you sort of like need to assume that this effect is not heterogeneous, okay, for different groups. Alternatively, we can estimate a theta j for each j in j1, okay? But I'm not gonna get into that too much. What I wanna get into is this over here, because this you can write lightly as a condition um, to obtain consistency and asymptotic normality, but then when you go and look at the actual applications, you're gonna see that, you know, quite often you do not have a lot of treated and a lot of controls. Actually, it's quite often that you have a lot of controls because imagine control groups could be anything. Think about states in the US, something happened um, to New Jersey, we said earlier, right? And then say like, okay, and now you can take any state that doesn't have a, a policy change that doesn't move, didn't move the minimum wage, and then you can consider that as a control. So typically, it is um, often the case that the number of control units could be large, but the problem is that the number of treated units typically tends to be low. So you need to think about that. So I wrote here thinking ahead, and this is just going to be one or two slides on issues that are beyond the scope of this class that I'm not gonna cover, and I covered some of these topics in 481, but but that are really important if you're gonna work on diff and diff and you want to understand what are the tools that are appropriate, okay? So that's what I wrote here, thinking ahead. It's not something I wanna emphasize, but it's something that I definitely wanna mention. Inference in diff and diff could be tricky and requires thinking, okay? Two issues are of particular importance. The first one is that what is exactly assumed to be large, okay? When you say there's a large, large what? Are groups going to infinity in general? Does that mean that the treated units are large, the control units are large? Or what happens if we have few treated groups but many controls? So that would be J1 is fixed, J0 goes to infinity. What happens if we have few treated uh, and control groups but many time periods? So you have fixed J1, fix J0, but you have T1 and T0 going to infinity. And then you can consider all sort of cases, okay, going around. So when you have multiple indices, and then we talk about this when we talk about panel data, you need to think about what's going to infinity. The second issue is time dependence. It is typically common to assume that the error terms that you're going to have in regressions are independent across groups, okay? But you would expect that these error terms are going to be correlated when you just look at a time series within a group. So, with individual data also, you would expect that the u i j t <clears throat> to be correlated with the u i prime j t, meaning that units in the same group could be dependent to each other even if they're in different time periods because they just say live in the same place or belong to the same group broadly. So, and I wrote here, each of these aspects have tremendous impact on which inference tools end up being valid or not. So, illustration of a case that is quite popular, actually. This is a very popular case. You have one treated unit and then you have a lot of controls. And then you assume that you have a fixed number of time periods before and after. So look at the diff and diff estimator. Well, it's the difference in differences, but now there's only one treated group. So the delta here 
is n1 there's only one and you have a bunch of controls okay that's why we're just taking an average of all the controls here well you do the usual manipulations to write this in terms of the use and then you obtain theta here and then you have this difference in difference where right now for the treated unit you just have one guy the first the, the group one which is the treated one and then you have the average of the control ones now suppose then I'm going to say, I'm going to have conditions, okay, to sort of like invoke here some uh, law of large numbers, okay, because the number of controls is going to infinity. And so here we have an average over the number of controls. Here we have a random variable, okay, that I'm going to call B. And then as long as expected value of B is zero, which happens here, then we can uh, go... And, you know, depending on what we assume on how the groups are, but suppose that we assume that the groups are independent, then uh, we're going to have a lot of large numbers. And all that means this term vanishes. And so what do you end up with? Well, you end up that the least squares estimator converges here. And you have theta, which is the effect that... Um, you're looking for, and then you have this difference of the sum of use before and after for the treated state. So definitely you see two things here. First, theta hat is not even consistent for theta. It does not converge in probability to theta. It converts to probability to theta plus some noise that is the sum of this use. Okay, this T1 is fixed, this is fixed. So, you know, it's just some of this, some use minus some other use. Um, however, it is still possible to do inference on theta. By that, I mean testing hypothesis or constructing a confidence set by using the approach proposed in Conley and Tamer, Tabor, sorry, um, or not in, or in similar settings by using some form of randomization approach, you know, where, um, something that we propose with Joe Romano and Asim Sheikh in a paper. And there's actually some very recent uh, papers, for example, one by Andres Hageman at Michigan, who deals with this particular problem. And this is a 2021 paper. So you can see how this is an active area of research where uh, tools are still being developed. But this is a difficult case from the point of view of doing inference. And even though tools may be still be developed and in a number of years when you need to, if you're using something like this and you have a case like this, there may be new tools. The important feature that I want to highlight is that you need to be aware that inference in different diff settings where you have very few treated units and maybe many controls or, you know, you, um, you can have other combinations of what's big and what's large is something that deserves attention, something that deserves your attention and you need to think about and you should not go and be blindly use some, you know, normal standard errors from um, Stata or R. Uh, without thinking about it, because, you know, you may be um, using approximations that are really, really poor uh, um, to approximate, to find a sample performance of uh, the estimators that you're using. Questions? All right, so let's keep moving so that we don't get uh, too uh, far behind. Um, common trends. You know, if we just look at what we did in diff and diff, we require this common trends assumption, which essentially said that, you know, both uh, groups were trending at the same rate. Okay. And then, you know, one way of writing that was using this parameterization where you have a, a unit effect and, and a time effect that is additive. Um, so one thing that people quote unquote like about this assumption is that it is quote unquote testable. People will just put pictures of, you know, the groups uh, before the treatment, okay? And try to see if they were like trending the same. You can actually formally test it depending on the setting. But most often as I wrote here, uh, people will like eyeball it, okay? And just based on pictures. So, but the problem is that quite often you eyeball it and then you're gonna see that the trends don't look alike. And then, you know, People still go ahead, but um, that doesn't look good to start with. But another feature that is kind of unpleasant is that 
this assumption is not robust to nonlinear transformations of the outcome variable. So you know that how sometimes, you know, we just look at wages and then, you know, you may look at log wages later because of this and that. And so the problem is that then if you need the common trends, um, you know, you need to assume common trends for the log wages. And if the common trends holds for the log wages, well, it will not hold for the levels. And if you make an assumption on the levels, it will not hold for the log difference. And so, you know, then the problem is that in some applications, you may actually need this two to hold at the same time because you're looking at one or the other and they will not hold at the same time. So if it holds for one, it will not hold for the other one. So that's kind of like um, one unpleasant feature about the common trends assumption. Um, but anyway, the important thing it is what you need for diff and diff to work. At least most often when you see applications of diff and diff, people try to, at some point, um, you know, at least provide some evidence that the common trends in their application actually seems to work or looks reasonable or something like that. But that's what we need to have in mind. Partly motivated by this, but not only, led to this alternative method called synthetic controls. I wrote here diff and diff, one, treats all control groups as being of equal quality as a control group, okay, which is taking average of all the control groups. And it requires common trends. Those are the two distinctive features that we want to remember. And here comes synthetic controls, where it says, starts saying, well, the researcher may want to somehow weight the controls um, in order to give more importance to those controls that seem better uh, for the given treaty group. So I said before, we were doing New Jersey in Pennsylvania. There's a reason why, you know, the original paper just compared New Jersey with Pennsylvania, because I said they just tried to look for things that were geographically close with the understanding that if you're like really close, there shouldn't be a lot of differences between the treatment and the control. Okay. But if you just think broadly, as I said before, you could have used any other state that is not Pennsylvania as a control group for New Jersey. Why not? Well, diff and diff, as I said, will just average any control that you toss at it. And it is true that if you just think conceptually, probably not all of them are equally good uh, to um, approximate the given treated state that you care about. So the idea here is that you're going to introduce weights and then we, you may give more weight to a, um, a control unit that looks similar or is similar in some form. Uh, to the treated unit that we're going to discuss in a minute. The second thing is that synthetic controls allows for an interactive effects model. So there are no common trends. So in particular, the model, you know, it can look like this. And I'm going to stick to this like really simple framework that I've been using so far, because this is enough for me to explain the main intuition. So of course, synthetic control is going to include covariates and other things, and it could be this could be vectors instead of scalars, uh, but I'm not going to get into that. This was originally proposed by Abadi and co-authors in a 2010 papers, ADH, uh, to study the effect of California's tobacco control program on statewide smoking rates. And during the time period in question, there were 38 states in the U.S. that did not implement such programs. Okay, so this is a question, uh, this is the case, again, where we have J1 is just one, which is California. J0, you know, is two, blah, 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 39 states, 38, because I'm starting from two. Okay, so I will um, include this as one of the cases where, you know, few treated many controls. ADH proposed choosing weights, a weighted average of potential outcomes, controls, sorry, formalizing a procedure that optimally chooses their weights. And we're going to go over that in some way. But that's the idea of synthetic controls. So let's think about it. I'm going to go back to my two by, by two model, okay? Except that now I'm going to allow to have many controls. So it's not going to be two by two. It's going to be two by, um, I don't know. But um, this is the main difference. We're going to have many controls. But still, we're going to have two time periods. And that's key. And we're going to have one treaty group, okay? The first one. So if we do a naive comparison, okay, between our treated group with any of the control groups, okay, just pick any of the control groups, and then you do the spective value of y12 minus yj2, 
well, you know, this is the potential outcome one because of the treated guy. And this is potential outcome zero. And what you have is this, because now we have this structure, right? Where, where we have um, gamma T times eta J plus U J T. And so we have that it confounds the treatment effect theta that we care about with some gamma two times the difference in the um, group differences, okay? So this approach does not identify theta in the presence of persistent group differences. Whenever this eta one is not equal to eta j. Of course, if we had a really good control, meaning a group j that is just similar, the same as um, the first one, this difference would be zero, you will recover theta, great. But that doesn't happen. So what's the idea behind synthetic control? The idea is to construct what we're gonna call a synthetic control. And synthetic control is going to be y tilde 1, 2. Notice, we know y 1, 2, 1. What we need is y 1, 2, 0, which we don't observe. So we're going to construct one that we're going to call it y tilde in the same way that we did that trick when we did diff and diff. And so what is that going to be? It's going to be a weighted average of all the control units. So we're going to go to the second time period okay, where the treatment took effect, and we're gonna take a weighted average of all the control units in the second time periods. And the trick here would be to choose these weights, okay? That's that's the difficulty. And the only thing we're gonna assume for now is that, you know, they're gonna be positive and they're gonna add up to one. So when is this gonna work? Well, is it, this is gonna work if we are constructing this synthetic control, the tilde guy, such that it has the same expectation as the object that we really want, which is this counterfactual outcome, y, one, two, zero. And if that's the case, then we can just compute the expected value of the y2 we observe minus the synthetic control, and then we recover theta. That's, that's the goal. Okay, fair. But now, how is this gonna work? Well, Look at these weights. Suppose that the weights are given. And one simplification that I'm gonna do throughout the derivations today that really simplifies things but doesn't happen in reality is that I'm gonna consider these weights are deterministic, okay? Now, I'm not, in reality, they're gonna be random later, but I'm not gonna treat them as random, okay? So notice, you compute the expected value of Y12 minus this synthetic control, which is, this is the synthetic control. And so now manipulate this expression. And what do you have? You have theta plus gamma two times eta one plus the average of all, weighted average of all those eta j's. So we can see now that this approach works if we can choose the weights so that the average of these eta j's, the weighted average of these eta j's equals eta one, which is the individual or group uh, effect uh, of group one. This is, however, invisible. And it's invisible because we do not observe these eta j's. So what is the result in this uh, synthetic controls paper? Well, suppose that there exists weights, okay? Then I'm gonna denote by omega star to distinguish from this omegas over here that again are positive and sum up to one such that this happens. Okay, so what are we doing here? We are choosing weights so that we can obtain the outcome of the treated unit in the pretreatment period, which is period one, as a weighted average of the control units in the pretreatment period. Okay, so we're choosing the weights to get as close as possible. In this case, it's perfect, okay? Now we're gonna discuss the as, as close as possible, but we're choosing weights, okay, such that we obtain the outcome of the treated unit in the, uh, the pretreatment period perfectly. And so now this is gonna be our synthetic control. And then if this is the case, what this paper shows is that then we can identify theta by using these weights and essentially doing the expected value of Y12 minus this y tilde 
which is just the weights that we defined before of the outcome in the second time period by using these weights omega j. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. Let's see how this works. Notice the pieces. Okay, first, um, omega j is determined by this equation over here. And then this is our synthetic control. <clears throat> so first, let me um, start with this equation one here. What is y11? It's in our notation, it's just going to be eta1 times gamma1 plus u11. And this is equal to the sum over j in j0 w star j of eta j gamma1 plus u j1. And then if you um, manipulate this a bit, you can write this as gamma1, eta1 minus the sum of j of wj star eta j. And then here we can write um sum w star j uj1 minus y1 u11 one, one, sorry and so we obtain that weights essentially satisfy this relationship over here Second, what we want to show is that this is going to lead to this over here. So let's do that. We're going to have expected value of y12 minus y tilde 1, 2, 0. And what is this? Well, the expected value of, um, let me just, instead of doing the expected values, I think it's going to be simpler to do the expected values later. So let's just write y12 minus, this is going to be cleaner for sure. This is going to be, all right, eta1, gamma2, plus u12, minus the sum from j, j naught of the omega stars. And then yj2 is just going to be eta j gamma 2 plus u j2. And I forgot here the theta. OK? So rewriting this is going to be theta plus gamma 2, eta 1 minus the sum omega j um, what am I doing? Uh, eta j. then plus all this with minus the sum j naught omega star j u j two minus u one two and let me do here divide by gamma one multiply by gamma one and so I can write this as theta plus gamma 2 over gamma 1 of the sum j wj star 
uj1 minus u11 minus the sum wj star uj2 u12 and then now if we just compute the expected value of this We have that this is zero, sorry, theta, since um, expected value of u, j, t is zero, and we are treating the omega j's as not random. To see how in this expression, you pass the expectation and you just have use that means zero. And then you see that if you then, instead of using the weights that will set the unit effects, the group effects as equal to the linear combination, you just define weights in this particular way just by matching, if you want, what happens before the treatment, then these weights when you just use them to control a synthetic control, to, to form a synthetic control in the second time period, they will be um, enough to recover the effect that you're looking for, like this. And so just look at the picture, for example, in that paper that I mentioned before, this is what the picture looks like, okay? Here in this vertical line, you have the policy change. Here you have the before, you have to have the after, the solid line is California, and the dashed line is this synthetic control. And so what you see is that before the change, the weights are chosen so that the synthetic control is essentially looking exactly like California, right? And then after the policy change, it deviates, and then for every time period, the difference between these two lines is the average treatment on the treated for a given time period, okay? And these pictures are the reason why synthetic controls in a way are popular because they look convincing, okay? Uh, which doesn't mean that synthetic controls works well all the time, but the picture looks very convincing because the method guarantees in a way, most often, or at least in some cases, that the uh, by construction, the matching before the treatment is kind of like great. So you look like, oh, look, I managed to recreate California before the treatment. And then after that, they typically deviate, okay? And so, oh, look, I just define my counterfactual. But of course, um, as I said, every method will require assumptions and there are assumptions behind synthetic controls as well. In fact, you know, let me discuss this. The weights are here by matching the observed outcome of the treated group and the control group in the periods before the policy changed. That's what we did. The thing is that in reality, this Y1 may not lie in the convex hull of all this, meaning that means there's not a, an exact linear combination of all these outcomes that will give you this one. So the method in reality relies on minimizing some notion of distance between this outcome and the weighted averages. The paper by ADH provides formal arguments. The formal arguments, for example, requires the number of pre-treatments to go to infinity. So they need a lot of pre-treatment periods in their asymptotic results so that they can justify that you're gonna have a nice uh, you know, approximation before. And they also use some independence of this use across J and T. Important to note that the model they consider does not require the common trends assumption, okay? So that's one deviation and one feature that distinguishes synthetic controls from diff and diff. Important thing number two is that if you look at the formal arguments in the paper, of course they have to account for the fact that these weights are random because they're just minimizing some distance. I just did very simple manipulations where I took expectations and ignore them. Of course, the similar results go through. The proofs are, of course, more involved but the conceptual idea is the same. Now, in reality, there are also covariates. And so when there are covariates, the method is typically extended, okay? And what it requires now, instead of just looking at the outcomes, that you will just look at the covariates before 
the treatment, okay? And you will just gonna take a linear combination of the joint thing of outcomes and covariates as a combination of weighted averages of outcome and covariates of the treated units. And that's how you define the weights, okay? So this weights, um, you know, will depend also on um, how you define distance. And at the end of the day, you're going to have an issue similar to the one that we describe in GMM. When you have like, you know, here vectors and vectors, you're going to have to use some weighting matrix to, you know, give precisely perhaps more importance to some variables than others. And depending on how you choose the weights or the weighting matrix, you know, how you're going to get uh, weight and so on. Uh, these are all details that I'm, we're not going to discuss in this class, okay? But um, the conceptual idea of synthetic controls and the main features behind synthetic controls are the ones that we described. In practice, and this is a lit literature also that the number of papers that um, came after the original one um, trying to extend and analyze the properties of synthetic controls. You know, one feature that is not so straightforward in synthetic controls is inference. So there are uh, different approaches that propose how to do inference in these settings on these uh, parameters. And there are uh, a bunch of different alternatives and it's hard to keep up. As I said, there are a lot of papers around it. If this is something that you are going to use, I think it is one of those topics where it makes sense to just try to make sure that you're up to date, and then you just know where the literature is uh, today when it comes to all these choices. You know how to choose the weights, how to uh, implement them well, how to do inference, and the like. All right, so that is all for today. I remind you that this is the last topic that will be part of the midterm exam, and right now I'm going to move to uh, questions, and um, and that'll be all. So. Let me stop the recording now.